I was 23 and I was in prison, surrounded by murderers, rapists, serial offenders. Perhaps I should be more precise, I wasn't exactly a prisoner, but I was in a prison because we were in Edinburgh as students about to perform a play that I directed at the Edinburgh Festival. And we decided we would like to try it out in Stroughton Prison, which is a long-term prison for serious offenders. And the governor was very generous in allowing us to do that. The play was Pericles by William Shakespeare. And most people have never heard of it, never let alone seen it, and so this was a bit of a challenge. But nevertheless, we were young, we were enthusiastic, and we had ideals. And so, the play begins with a chorus, which in our case was played by three people, two of whom were beautiful young women, Barbara and Judith. They came onto the stage, the prisoners went mad. Whooping, shouting, cheering, catcalling. The very first scene of the play was about incest, actually child abuse. It involved a father who was abusing his daughter. Another Judith came on, another very beautiful young woman. Far from it shocking the audience, <coughs> All the references to the child abuse, the incest, and in fact, this gorgeous young woman made them get more and more excited. And so it was, as every successive, attractive young woman came onto the stage, they got more and more excited. I began to think, maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. <laughs> Until the middle of the play, when there is a storm, and as often the case with Shakespeare, in the storm, tragedy happens, but also hope. And Pericles loses his wife. The storm is at sea, and she dies in childbirth. And she has to be lowered overboard into the sea. And Pericles is left holding his little baby. By this time, the atmosphere had changed to one of rapt attention. Then there's a time jump. And the little baby Marina, called Marina because she was born at sea, is now a 15-year-old. Her father has let her be brought up elsewhere. He hasn't seen her for 15 years. And then there is a murder attempt. Now, the audience had bought into this young girl and they watched carefully as she was murdered or attempted to be murdered. She escaped and then was forced to be a prostitute in a brothel. And as the pimp was trying to get her to prostitute herself, she refused to do so, has a wonderfully strong speech, and eventually convinces him to let her teach. And if only she could teach, she would earn more money. So he agrees to that. Unknown to her, her father was still alive, although he was by this time having a nervous breakdown. He could hardly speak because of the loss of his wife and his daughter, who he believed to be dead. And someone suggested that this man, who was having this nervous breakdown, should encounter this young woman because she had such powerful healing properties. And so they met. And in this wonderful scene at the end of Shakespeare's play, the father and the daughter are reunited and many of the prisoners cried. It was at that moment that I thought, I want to be a theatre director. And they cried because someone understood what it was like to be separated for that length of time, for years and years and years, from your wife, from your daughter, and maybe never to see them again, and most importantly, to be forgiven. At the heart of that was empathy. Now we'll move forward 18 years, and I'm in a small room, not much bigger than this space here. And this time, the audience of about a dozen women are sitting around in this front room of a place called Turning Point, which is a charity. 
These women are all addicted to prescription bud, bud, drugs. And this time I'm doing a play called The Last Yankee by Arthur Miller, the world premiere, well, the British premiere actually, of his play. And this play is about two women who are seriously addicted to prescription drugs, a cocktail really, Valium, Prozac. And we were towards the end of rehearsal and I thought we owed it to the kind of women who were suffering in this way to be certain that our account was authentic, sensitive and real. And I thought the best way to do that would be to play it for them and find out because frankly I had no idea what it was really like being afflicted in that way, what it felt like when the drugs were coursing through your system. So we played the play, no props, no costumes, just their rehearsal clothes in a tiny little front room. And at one point, Zoe Wanamaker, who was playing the main role, started crying and the sound of the sobbing of the women as close to her as I am to the front row here, closer in fact, was simultaneous with her own sobbing. And these women realized someone understands. Someone understands. Not only does someone understand, but there is hope for me in my situation. Now we'll go forwards another 10 years. This time I'm in a pub outside of Doncaster. And I was making a film for the BBC set in the miners' strike, the 1984-85 miners' strike. And I'd agreed with the BBC that all of the supporting artists, or what commonly known as extras, would be people from the local community. And we decided to set up a community project. The film was called Faith. And the community project was going to be called Have Faith. And I said, put it around through the television and through the local newspapers, it wasn't social media at the time, that anybody who wanted to be in this film could be in this film and work alongside professional actors like Maxine Peake, Clive Russell. And I said, there's only one condition. That is, you have to come to an acting workshop before. If you're prepared to do that and still want to do it, then you can be in the film. 350 people decided they wanted to be in the film. And the first workshop I held was in this tiny room above a pub. And frankly, the miners, former miners, most of them, some still miners, although that pit had sadly closed down, um, they were very, very, very suspicious. Who was this person from the South? because the BBC, frankly, had deceived them badly. There was even famous footage in which they reversed the order of events on the 9 o'clock news, which made it look as if miners were throwing bricks and then the police charged. Actually, it was entirely the other way around. The police charged miners in trainers and T-shirts, and then the miners threw mud. It was a conscious decision on behalf of the BBC, who was supporting Margaret Thatcher's, Thatcher's government at that time, to distort the truth. So no miners were going to take very kindly to this young man from the south of England coming and making a film. But actually, we began working. They sat in a, in a circle and I showed them a book which had wonderful photographs from the miners' strike. And all they had to do was pick one photograph each. They could pick any photo they wanted to. And when they'd all picked their photograph, we began to construct an improvisation around that photograph. Now, the interesting thing was the one thing these people wouldn't do, they would not play policemen. And were even worse, they wouldn't play scabs. And the idea of playing a scab, for those of you who don't know what a scab is, it's the term in trade unionism for breaking a strike, a strike breaker. 
That was about the worst thing you could possibly be. But, so I had to persuade them, not only that they were, I was going to make a film that would honour them, but also why they should be required to do this. And I did this, as in the first two instances, through empathy, to help them understand two things. One, what it is, might be like being somebody else, and also what the purpose of the whole event was. Once they understood that, they were on board. And on that first workshop, one man called Glyn, <coughs> Glyn Courtney, bravely stepped forward and said he'd experiment with being a scab. He wasn't even interested in being in this film to begin with. He'd just come because his daughters wanted to be in it. And so I worked with him. I tried to make him feel safe and tried to help him create what it would be like being this other human being in these circumstances. Last night, I texted him. I hadn't spoken to him for 30 years. I, want, I told him I was going to be doing this talk today, and I said, I just want to know that I'm not imagining or romanticizing this. And I said, do you think about this at all? It was... 30 years ago, he said, I think of it every day. Even yesterday, I was looking at photographs of us filming it. That was the first time I really felt I was part of a family, working alongside people like Maxine, and working and being pushed. And it made me feel I was worth something. It made me feel confident. It made me feel what it was like to be respected. Now, when we began this degree course, the, I was given the great privilege of being asked to be professor of theatre here, but also simultaneously to continue in, with my involvement at the Octagon Theatre, and I'm associate artistic director there, which means I direct two of the Octagon's productions a year. So I am simultaneously working as a teacher and as a director. And eight years ago, when I got the job at the Octagon, I thought I'd actually take a look at what my practice as a director really was like, to see if I could develop it and learn from it. And one of the things that I now do, at the beginning of every, the first day of every rehearsal, the actors and I sit around a table with other people, other members of the creative team, and I put them a proposition. Now, I learned this proposition from my third son, who's a cross-country runner, or was when he was 15, when I learned, because I used to take him to his races and to training, about the PB, the personal best. And I said to them, if we were doing our PB production of whatever the play is, we're not going to compare it with anybody else's. It's just our personal best production. What would we, how would we do that? And then we discuss it. Now, almost every time, different groups of actors start off with the same proposition, which is, I want it to be a safe space. I want to feel safe. I want to feel able to fail. I want to be able to risk failure. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be humiliated. I want to be made to feel that everyone is working together to create something feeling safe. We then go on to discuss how we do that. Now, when I started the task of teaching here, I found myself adopting exactly the same practice with the students, which is to start every, not necessarily every lesson, but every module by saying, how are we going to do this as well as we possibly can? And what it makes us all know is that we are learning together. If you look at little babies, I have a, a, a niece who has a little three-year-old son, beautiful little boy called Noah. Learning is as natural as breathing. No one has to teach a baby to learn, or a young person. They, 
they want to learn as much as they want. They want to put those bricks together. They want to know what that word means. They want to know what that is. They want to know what that color is. The role of the rest of us is to help them learn. And the role of the director or the teacher is to help learning happen. To create the circumstances that are safe, where creativity can happen without fear. Now, there are things that get in our way of doing that. Much of that has been created by the world in which we live. These little babies are subjected to all kinds of terrible things that happen to them psychologically, in terms of their social background, in terms of the kind of treatment they, they get from adults, the treatment they get from institutions. I don't, by any means, mean to imply that teachers are in any way responsible for this. It's the system that's responsible for that. And we have all had wonderful, wonderful teachers who have made a huge difference in our life. But two things that if I was, of course, as an artistic director, when I direct a play, I can direct it however I want to. I can do whatever I want to do. I can rehearse it for as long as I want to within the financial constraints. I can rehearse it how I want to. I can proceed how I want to. In an educational institution, of course, you can't do that, really. If I could, of course, the very first thing I would do would be a scrap any marking of any kind and scrap any examinations. Because to mark people numerically is about as stupid as me in a rehearsal room marking actors and saying, I'm going to give you a mark at the end of this rehearsal process. I'm going to give you a 40 or a 29 or a 30. Do we think that would help actors? It would inhibit them. It would make them feel judged at every step of the way. It would be a completely pointless activity. Marking students is equally pointless, in my opinion. Not only is it pointless, it actually is counterproductive. It induces fear, anxiety, and concern, when we should actually be creating exactly the opposite. Safety to create without fear. And we have to look at the whole business of assessment in a completely different way. Assessment should just be like it is in my rehearsal room. I aim, strive, and want to give actors feedback, positive, helpful advice and feedback. And in so doing, that helps them achieve their PB. In a teaching institution, that is exactly what we should be doing. We can't, really, because the system won't let us. But insofar as we can sneak under the radar, the more we can regard feedback as being constructive, helpful, and the more we can allow students to really believe that it is a good thing to not know something, because not knowing something makes you find and discover how to know it and how to achieve your PB. Thank you.